outline there. One Sunday, a preacher had preached an especially long and boring sermon. And I know that never happens around here. Uh, as the congregation filed out, one man commented, he said, Preacher, your sermon today, it really reminded me of the peace and love of God. And the preacher said, well, thank you. He said, how nice of you to say that. He said, what exactly about my message was it that reminded you of the peace and the love of God? He said, well, he said, it reminded me of the peace of God because it was beyond all human understanding. He said, it reminded me of the love of God because it endured forever. Um, about three more laughed than, than did in first service. So that's good. Uh, off to a rough start, but we'll land this plane in a minute. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 3. That's where we're going to uh, be today in our, our message. Acts chapter 3, starting right there with verse 1. Today, uh, as we look in verse 1, we find that Peter and John went to the temple, it says, one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. Now, devout Jews observed three times of prayer each day. They had one at 9 a.m., uh, a second time at 3 p.m., and then a, a third time of prayer at sunset. And, and many Jews would try to make it to the temple for at least one of those times of daily prayer. And that's, why, that's where uh, Peter and John were going, uh, to the temple to observe the 3 o'clock time of prayer there. Verse 2, we read on. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Now the scriptures tell us that this man had been lame uh, since birth. And apparently he'd been born with some type of, of defect that had caused his legs to not work properly and basically rendered them powerless. Acts chapter 4 gives us a little bit more information about him, telling us that he was over 40 years old and had never walked a day in his life. Now, just think about that for a minute. Sometimes we read these stories and we don't really fully grasp the impact of things like this in the lives of the people involved. Think about this young man. His parents likely knew early on their child was not going to be like other people's children. And that was a big blow to them. Other kids would play together in the streets, but their child would only be able to sit and watch. His parents had likely carried him or pulled him perhaps in some type of cart since he was a baby and even on into adulthood if they wanted to include him in their daily life and activities. He'd always been dependent upon other people. It had become his way of life, part of his mentality, his way of thinking. It's now likely that his parents were gone, and now he was left to resort to begging in order to survive. You know, being lame was an even bigger ordeal back then than it would be today. He knew that he would likely never be able to get a job, never be able to support himself in that time, much less support a family. He had people who were kind enough to take him to the temple gate so that he could beg for charity. And this is what life had become for him. Every time it seemed that life changed, it had been a downgrade. Less life to be lived. Less options. Less fulfillment. He'd been constantly adjusting and downgrading his quality of life. Verse 3, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. You know, life as a crippled man was all he'd ever known. As he continued to go through adversity, he continued to uh, adapt his idea of normal life. He'd hit such a low now that his daily life consisted of sitting at the temple gate and begging strangers for money, hoping that he would end up at the end of the day with enough to eat hoping he could count on the kindness of others to not only give him money, but hoping that he could count on the dependability of others to come back and get him at the end of the day and take him back to his home and lay him in his bed so that he could sleep that night before doing it again the next day. He long ago gotten over his pride that might have once kept him from asking a stranger for help because today, quite frankly, his very livelihood depended upon it. Perhaps... He had learned that it was easier. It's easier on your pride if you just don't make eye contact. 
And maybe the people passing in and out of the temple felt the same way. Because as they were going into the temple to do something religious and holy, they felt obligated to help out this poor beggar here at the gate. And so surely they would reach in their pocket and find their guilt offering and place it in his tin cup. But maybe it was easier for them too if they just didn't look him in the eye. So they would drop it in and walk by. Maybe he would just hold the cup up and, and not look at them because too hard on what shred of pride he might have had left perhaps without even looking up he just asked for help verses 4 and 5 says Peter and John don't miss this looked at him intently and Peter said look at us and the lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money Now it seems as you read this that Peter is emphasizing that he stopped and he looked at this man and he asked the man to look at him. I don't think that's an insignificant point here. Perhaps Peter wanted this man to know that he wasn't going to be like everybody else that had been in and out of that temple that day or so many days before and had just mindlessly walked by and dropped something in the poor crippled man's cup without seeing him. Peter stopped, and it's as if he said, I see you. You're not just a part of the background. You're not just an extra in this drama that is my life. You're not just a a two-bit player in this drama that unfolds. But I see you, and I want you to look and see me. And I've been convicted by that this week as the Lord has, has worked on me Because I think it's all too easy to have the central characters in our life, the the people that we, our family, our friends, our circle, our network, but then everybody else just becomes an extra. And we see them, but we don't see them. We just kind of patronize here and there, and we don't really see people. I think it's interesting that Peter stops, and he says he looked intently at this man, and he asked the man to look at him. In return, you know, the man was expecting a handout. Verse 5 says he looked at Peter expecting some money, but instead, Peter gave him a hand up. We're going to talk about that a little bit today. Verses 6 and 7. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. It's interesting that Dr. Luke notices the transformation that happens in the man's feet and ankles that suddenly something medically changed in this man. You know, I want to talk just a little bit today about knowing the best way to help someone. It's hard to have a policy and say, this is the way we'll always help everybody. Because it's not necessarily one size fits all. There are different ways that are the best ways to help different people in different situations. The crippled man in today's text was asking Peter for sustenance, with help with sustenance for that day. That was his concern, what he was worried about. But God wanted to give this man a means of sustenance for his lifetime. God had a bigger picture of how he wanted to help this man. And let me first say this today. There are definitely times when the right thing to do is to give someone, and I'm just going to call it a handout today. And by that, I want you to understand, I mean helping them for that moment in that situation, giving them something tangible and immediate right then. There are people who genuinely cannot provide for themselves, whether it's because of mental limitations, physical handicaps, extreme circumstances in their lives that are beyond their control. Matthew chapter 25 says this, For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Obviously, as Christians, we should be the first to help people in their time of need. Those who especially who cannot help themselves. 1 John chapter 3 says this, If someone has enough money to live well 
and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion? How can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let's show the truth by our actions. Do you all find that as convicting as I do? Do we see people or are they just background figures in our drama, our life? There are even times when as Christians, we may just choose to bless somebody simply to demonstrate the love of Jesus to them. And you know, maybe it's true that they got themselves in this mess. And maybe they made their bed and yeah, now they're laying in it. And maybe you could say, well, helping them, it, it, it just, it's not going to make an impact. It's not going to do any good. But sometimes I think the Spirit leads us to bless them anyway. Because we just want them to see the love of Jesus in a very practical and tangible way. Hebrews 13, 16 says, And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. When in doubt, if you're wondering, is it the right thing to, to help this person or not? One of the things that I've just felt the Lord lay on my heart this week. When in doubt, err on the side of being generous. Yeah, you'll get taken advantage of some. Have you ever given money to somebody in one of these big cities and then they go straight to the liquor store and you watched it and you go, well, I just donated to the cause. Sometimes you'll get taken advantage of. But if you're going to err, err on the side of being generous. Here's why. Luke chapter 6. Give and you will receive. Your gift will, will return to you in full. Press down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. And sometimes it's so easy in our uh, materialistic culture today, our consumer culture today, to, to get caught in this cycle of just making sure we hang on to what's ours. And we say, well, I just don't, I don't feel like life's fair to me right now. I just don't seem to be getting any breaks. And, and I would just ask you today, could it be that maybe you just need to open up your heart a little bit and start focusing outwardly a little bit. And this scripture sure implies that sometimes the blessing that goes around has its way of coming back around to us. By the same measure that you deal out to others, that same measure has a way of coming back to you. But there's also a time, and I want to say this today too, when giving someone a handout, that, that immediate take care in the moment, meeting a need right now, sometimes doing that, especially doing it repeatedly, can be detrimental. When someone is able to provide for themselves, sometimes the right thing to do is to give them an opportunity instead of a handout. Let me talk just a few minutes today about the harm of repeated handouts. Sometimes we rob that person of the intrinsic reward of work. Many people today have bought into this notion that, that work is a curse to be avoided. And they say, well, you see, it is in the Bible that, that, that God cursed Adam and Eve's labor and, and it's just part of the, And if I can get out of the curse and figure out a way to get something for nothing, well, I'm beating the system and all the better for me. But understand this today. Even some Christians believe that the fact that we have to work is due to the sin of Adam and Eve. But understand this, Adam was working in the garden long before the fall, long before sin entered into the picture. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. God not only created this beautiful garden, but he created Adam and Eve, and he put Adam in the garden and says, Here is your purpose. Work this. Manage it. Take care of it. That's why you get up every day. That's your purpose and how you'll find fulfillment. Many of you know what I'm talking about when I say that our labor has its own intrinsic reward. How many of you, there are things that you would do even if you didn't get paid for it because you know the intrinsic reward of certain things. And, and you say, well, why do you do that? Because it has its own reward. I get fulfillment from doing that. There is a satisfaction we can get by looking back at what we accomplished. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. So I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. 
then I realize that these pleasures are from the hand of God. Yeah, there are times when our work can be a real drag. It can be monotonous. It can be boring. But also, if we look for it, there can be times when we look back and we say, I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad. And I, I contributed something today. And sometimes when we take that from people, we take their sense of purpose, their sense of fulfillment that I believe God ordained within the work itself. And we're robbing people of that. Secondly, we can lose our sense of independence if we begin to develop a mindset of helplessness. It's God's will that all able-bodied, and people that are of able mind, understand me, but able-bodied people provide for themselves. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 says, Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. Then people who are not believers will respect the way you live, and you will not need to depend on others. Sometimes we all need a helping hand. Sometimes we all might need a, a bit of help in what it, financial or some other means. But he says, as long as you're able, make your own way in life so that you won't be dependent upon others. You know, when we continually learn to be dependent, it can develop a mindset of helplessness. And I'm telling you myself, there are certain things that I know I'm not good at. And I've caught myself this week uh, of just thinking, uh, the Lord's kind of laid on my heart, there's times when it comes to a certain area and I think, I'm not even going to try that, you know. Who can I call that can help me with this? Because I'm not even going to try it. And, and, and I've learned helplessness in some of these areas. And you lose confidence in your ability to take care of these things yourself. Your first reaction is to ask for help without even thinking of how you can take care of it yourself. Your sense of self-worth diminishes it can even contribute to depression when your image of what you're capable of gets smaller and smaller and you accept that over time. Thirdly, it's so easy, easier than you think, to develop an entitlement mentality. Now hear me out. Once people receive help on a frequent basis, they begin to expect these things to where if they don't get the charitable help of others, then they get angry. And over time, they even become convinced they have a right to those things. In the past 50 years, America has developed an entitlement mentality. I don't know if you paid attention to this in our culture, but the word entitlements is used to describe the money that is distributed to Americans in the form of, of aid in various different categories and ways. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying we should do away with that. There is definitely a need for that. But what I'm saying is in the last 50 years, the statistics show we are abusing that and way overextending it. Did you know that in the 50 years between 1960 and 2010, entitlements exploded from 28% of federal spending to 66% of federal spending today is spent on entitlements. It's more than doubled the percentage of our federal spending there's a quote from an, uh, that's often attributed to Alexander Tyler. And it says that an entitlement culture is the inevitable ruin of a democracy like ours. And he said this years ago. Listen to his words. He says a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover they can vote themselves money from the public treasury. And from that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose physical policy, always followed by a dictatorship. And the average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been 200 years. It's interesting that if that's the average, America has had a democracy for around 239 years or so. So we're a little over the average actually but if you pay attention to world events our economy is struggling and I think a big part of that is that we just expect things and we've gone from being a nation of producers that we were once were just a generation or two ago to now we're becoming a generation that says what can you do for me and it's changed our country drastically we have an increasing number of people today who simply it's not that they cannot work it's that they don't want to work. 
and they're content to live off the charity of others. The Bible's clear that every effort should be made to distinguish between those two categories of people. The Bible is the first to say, yes, help those who cannot help themselves. And sometimes just generously pour out charity and love even to others. But also be wise enough that you will not just enable people who could work but refuse to. Listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. Now let me take this opportunity today to tell you about one of the, the programs that our, our church is involved with that is kind of along these lines today. Uh, the ministry is called ROSM. And it's a, an acronym that stands for the Resource Office for Social Ministries. And it's a cooperative effort between various churches in our community and some of uh, the uh, community agencies that help people in need. And so it's a wonderful cooperative effort here. It receives no government funding. Um, but we utilize a web-based uh, database, a web source database, so that uh, for, for centuries... Churches have experienced this where certain people looking for something for nothing will go around and ask for help from every single church and everybody thinks they're the only ones helping them but really everybody's helping them and they're exploiting and taking from the Lord's resources unfairly. And so this is all online and so when you help someone you log in so the left hand knows what the right hand's doing and we can start to sort out those who need help versus those that are exploiting the system. But it's to help prevent being taken advantage of and wasting resources on people that could help themselves. Another thing I like about this program is that it is focused on not only giving a hand out in a time of need, but also giving a hand up and helping people be able to stand on their own. Uh, this program works to train recipients in job skills and, and education and what are called soft skills that help you get and keep jobs and so forth. But it also works to inform people of what resources are available to help them and their families. And of course we're here to help people. But our ultimate goal is to get them to where they can stand on their own feet. And I'm so proud of those of, of you in our congregation that have been involved and worked with this ministry very closely. And I want to tell you, you're doing a wonderful work. Uh, and I believe that, that we're on the right track with this program. But our goal is to do more than just administer a a handout that will help for a few days. But we strive to give a hand up that can perhaps change a future for a family. Acts chapter 3 verse 8 goes on. The man, he jumped up, he stood on his feet, and he began to walk. Isn't that our goal? And then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And don't you know they had a good time of worship that day? I want to conclude today by talking about We've talked about in a practical sense the applications here. I want to talk, as we conclude, in a spiritual sense the applications of today's text. Sometimes God gives you more than you asked for because you didn't know really what to ask for. Spiritually speaking, sometimes I think we're a lot like this crippled beggar that we ask God for little things that meet our immediate needs in that moment instead of seeing the big picture of what God really has in mind for us. We can only focus on the superficial needs that are right in front of our face, but we're blind to the deeper, the bigger picture issues that are really at play. We sometimes focus our prayers on asking God to take away our little hurts and our inconveniences in our life. But sometimes God knows that those little hurts and those inconveniences are working for a bigger picture, serving a bigger purpose. Sometimes God knows that we need to be inconvenienced for a time and maybe unhappy for a time because he is bringing about a long-term solution. I've thought a lot about this this week. We ask God sometimes in prayer, God, take away this situation because this is uncomfortable. I want this out of my life now. And God, this right over here, this is stressful for me. So if you could take this away, that'd be great too. And God is saying, look, these are the tools that I'm using 
to give you a long-term solution because I want you to be more than just happy today. I want to do something in you that's going to get you on your feet, spiritually speaking. You need a stronger faith today because I know something that's coming down the road and I want you to be equipped for that. And I know something that, that I have in mind as a sculptor. I want to chip away some things in your life because I see the beauty of what you're going to enjoy down the road here. And so you're going to deal with these inconveniences for a time. And I'm not going to do these things you're asking. We ask God to take away all the unpleasant scenarios. But sometimes God wants us to walk through some stuff because he's building something in us. I, can, I thought this week... I can look back at my life today, and I, I've still got a long way to go spiritually. I mean, understand that. But I, I can look back and think I am where I am spiritually today, and it has more to do with the trials that I've been through than it does the mountaintop experiences I've had in my life. Can you all say that today? How many of you can say honestly, looking at where you are today, you are where you are in your faith walk with God and it has more to do with the trials you and the Lord have walked through, the challenges, the adversity that has driven you to your knees, stretched your faith, got you way uncomfortable, but you learned to be dependent upon the Lord, to trust His Spirit. You dug into the Word and found promises, and you tenaciously clung to them in prayer. Sometimes that's how God does His best work. And I can can thank God as the Apostle Paul did and say God I thank you even for my trials now I want to preface that by saying let's don't get carried away God <laughs> let's don't get carried away but I can thank you for my trials and I'm starting to see the value of the struggle in my life Romans chapter 5 says this we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. I came across something this week that I want to I share with you today. I'm going to read it slowly so you can kind of concentrate on the wisdom here. There's a lot of wisdom here. It says, I asked for strength. And God gave me difficulties to make me strong. I asked God for wisdom. And, and God gave me problems to solve. I asked for prosperity, and God gave me brawn and brains to work. I asked for courage, and God gave me dangers to overcome. I asked for patience, and God placed me in situations where I was forced to wait. I asked for love, and God gave me troubled people in my life that needed me. I asked for favors, and God gave me opportunities. I asked for everything so I could enjoy life, but instead God gave me life and taught me to enjoy everything. I received nothing I wanted, but I received everything that I needed. Friends, when we pray, we need to keep in mind that sometimes God is more interested in, than, than in just us being happy in the day-to-day. -day. God is interested many times in the big picture, and some of these things that we see as thorns are working a purpose in our lives. Friends, when we pray, we need to realize that God is wanting to build something that will last. God is interested in more than just giving you alms to get you through a day conveniently. But God wants you to stand up on your feet, spiritually speaking, and have the kind of faith that will weather the storms that lie in your future. He wants to build something in you that's going to lead you to understand what true joy is all about, what true fulfillment is all about, and that storm that you're walking through right now, it may be a huge part of that. James chapter 1 says this, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I don't know how everything's going to play out in your life, but I do know this. God will be enough. Whatever situation you're in today, God is already in your tomorrow, and he will be enough. And God many times is building, and there is a purpose. If you ask God to take it away, and it still remains, it's either there for a time, or it's there for a reason. I want to encourage you to think about the things that you've been asking God for in prayer. And this is my last point. Think about the things that you're asking God for in prayer right now. 
could it be that you're just asking for temporary fixes? You're just worried about the simple things. I want this out. I want this gone. And God is thinking about getting you to a point where you can stand on your own feet. He's worried about building your faith and who he wants you to become. Could it be that your real problem is a spiritual one that he wants to fix once and for all so that you don't keep struggling with the effects? You see, we, we pray so much over symptoms and God says, I want to get to the cause. When are we going to get to that? Maybe those little pestering problems and needs are just symptoms of a real problem that we need to start praying, God, open my eyes and help me to see the big picture you see. Maybe the first thing you need more than anything else is to make Jesus Christ the top priority in your life. And I know what you're thinking. Greg, Jesus is the top priority in my life. That's why I'm here today. I'm just telling you this. As someone that has been a baptized believer in Jesus Christ since I was 10 years old, there are times when I have to empty the jar out of my life and put the rocks back in and reprioritize. And that leads to a lot of problems sometimes. And when I empty the jar and put things back in, things seem to work better. And maybe without even realizing that you've done it, you've let other things take top priority in your life. And God says, you know, we keep talking about this, this, and this, but the thing you really need to do is empty the jar out and put the big rocks in first, and you'll find everything starts working better. Maybe that's what God's talking to somebody here about today. I want to leave you this last scripture. Matthew 6, it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. This is my favorite verse. And live righteously, and he'll give you everything else you need. You see, when you get that first big rock right, and if you readjust some of those priorities and say, Jesus, you are my top priority. And, or maybe, Jesus, you haven't been lately, and I'm going to fix that. God says, that's the bigger picture I've been wanting to take care of. I want you to stand on that, and let me take care of these other things that you've been sweating. Would you pray?